After watching this video, you should be able to describe the mechanism of insulin-mediated effects, specifically glucose uptake by skeletal muscle and adipose cells. You should also be able to describe the effects of AMP-dependent kinase on glucose uptake by skeletal muscle and fat cells, and describe some of the clinically relevant non-metabolic effects of insulin. So let's start here with the metabolic effects of insulin, and this is a review of the feedback control of plasma glucose as shown in the previous video. And we have the beta cells, we have hepatic glucose production and skeletal muscle and adipose glucose uptake, and we have our plasma glucose, which is the controlled variable. Now, when insulin goes up, uh, for example, if you eat a meal rich in, in glucose, you get insulin secretion, and insulin binds to receptors on the liver, and when that happens, you suppress hepatic glucose production, and when insulin binds to receptors on skeletal muscle and adipose cells, you get an increase in glucose uptake. And the combination of these two things lowers the plasma glucose and stabilizes it back down to the normal range. Uh, keep in mind that, uh, again, this is a feedback loop. So we started with the glucose going up, and the net effect was glucose was going back down to normal. Um, and so what we're going to focus on in this video is a transduction pathway for insulin specifically glucose uptake by skeletal muscle and adipose cells. So let's take a look at what that will be, um, starting with insulin binding, going through all the intracellular events, ultimately leading to glucose uptake. Now, like we dis um, discussed, when insulin goes up, glucose uptake goes up. And so if we start with, here's insulin binding its receptor, right here, is the net effect, right? Glucose transporters will go to the membrane and glucose will go from the outside and go into the cells and that's your glucose uptake. So how does insulin, when it binds this receptor, lead to the translocation of these transporters in the membrane, okay? That's really what we're gonna work out. Now, the insulin receptor belongs to a superfamily called receptor tyrosine kinases and that means that the receptor itself has tyrosine kinase activity. Now tyrosine is abbreviated um, Y, okay, and you can see that the intracellular part of the insulin receptor has tyrosine residues, and when insulin binds to the insulin receptor, there's an autophosphorylation of uh, tyrosine residues on the insulin receptor, which then recruits proteins that recognize phosphorylated tyrosine residues. Now, the domains that happen to recognize tyrosine residues are called SH2 and SH3 domain. SH2 and SH3 is, um, stands for sarcomology domain, all right? And you can see here that insulin receptor substrate happens to have those kinds of domains, which draws it, attracts it, to this phosphorylated tyrosine portion of the insulin receptor. And now you start to get an assembly of proteins that will lead ultimately to the translocation of glucose transporters to the surface of skeletal muscle and adipose cells. So when insulin receptor substrate comes over and binds via its sarcomology domain, its tyrosine residues get phosphorylated, and you can see that by these, by these blue phosphates, and then that attracts other proteins that have uh, sarcomology domains, um, and that would be PI3 kinase, or phosphoinositide 3 kinase, okay? And it has um, recognition sites for those phosphorylated tyrosines, and what it's going to do, it's a lipid kinase, it's going to phosphorylate a very important phospholipid called PIP2 and convert it to PIP3. Now, I think it's a good idea to take a look at um, a little more what, what, that, what that actually um, is chemically, all right? And you can see that this is a phospholipid. Here is the cell membrane, and, and this is the inside of the cell here, and this is the membrane portion here, and you can see our fatty acyl chains, which are lipid, uh, which are, lipid are uh, in and a, a associated with the inner leaflet of, of the, of the uh, plasma membrane. And you can see that here that you have the um, the phosphate, which is always part of a phospholipid, attached to the head group. In this case, the head group is an inositol sugar, 
which in, um, already has, and the way we've depicted it here, has been phosphorylated at the 4 and 5 position. So the complete name for this particular phospholipid is phosphoinositol or phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, or PIP2. Okay, and you can see that those uh, carbons 4 and 5 have been phosphorylated. All right, and, and this part of the phospholipid faces the intercellular part of the cell, the, the cytoplasm. Okay, so if we go back to our picture, all right, um, we can see that the PIP3 now, okay, has now an extra phosphate, and there's the inositol sugar with the three phosphates, right, the triphosphorylated inositol, and that now serves as a docking site for a variety of proteins that have recognition sites for triphosphorylated inositols, or this PIP3. And those are called plextrin homology domains, or pH domains. And this important kinase here called PDK, or phosphoinositide dependent kinase, it makes sense why it's called that because it depends on this PIP3. When this PDK gets attracted to this pH domain, all right, or the, this PIP3 via its pH domain, it gets activated, and what it does is it phosphorylates some different proteins, an important one being AKT, or uh, it, it's often called protein kinase B. And this kinase, once it gets phosphorylated, gets activated, okay, and it does a bunch of things, does lots of other metabolic effects we discuss on, on lipid metabolism and, and so on and so forth. But in this case, what we're focusing on is its effects to facilitate glucose transporters to go to the surface of skeletal muscle and fat. And what it does is it, its target is an AKT substrate of, of 160 kilodaltons, AS160. And AS160, when it gets phosphorylated by AKT, we can see here it becomes inactivated, all right? Which means that it's not going to do what it normally does, which is to serve as a gap or a GTPase activating protein. And what it does as we, when it's in the activated state, we can see here is that it takes RAB, which is a monomeric G protein, which is very important in trafficking these GLUT4 vesicles to the surface, and it takes it from the GTP or active state and activates the GTPase activity to make it go to the GDP or inactivated state. So that's normally what AS160 does when it's in the active state. So when insulin goes through this whole transduction pathway, it's taking away AS160's um, effect on the RAB and making it so it stays in the active form so it can facilitate translocation of these GLUT4 vesicles, these GLUT4 transporters to go get inserted into the membrane so glucose can go into the cell. And that's really what we started with. Insulin promotes glucose uptake in skeletal muscle and fat, and it has to go through this whole process to do it, okay? Now, um, we could talk about a couple of other important points. Now, uh, everybody knows that exercise is good for you, all right? And particularly diabetics, type 2 diabetics, who have a lot of insulin resistance, um, exercise is a very important part of their therapy. And one thought is that when exercise um, is happening, there's an increase of a very important kinase called AMP kinase. And AMP kinase works in a very similar way that AKT does to phosphorylate and turn off AS160. So you can imagine that exercise in someone who has type 2 diabetes will make the person more insulin sensitive. In other words, it makes this pathway work better. Okay, So um, that's an important consideration for patients who have insulin resistance. And, and by the way, um, one of the thoughts for insulin resistance, one, one of the ver variety of different uh, mechanisms that people think about is that when there's um, insulin resistance, there's these molecules that are coming from fat cells called adipokines, like for example TNF-alpha or um, resistin, for example, and when they bind to receptors on insulin uh, sensitive tissues, they might tone down this uh, pathway that we discussed here. And so you can see exercise plays a very important role there um, in making the um, skeletal muscle cells, for example, become more sensitive to insulin. All right, so that summarizes
starting from insulin binding to autophosphorylation to a variety of important protein assembly and phosphorylations, ultimately leading to GLUT4s going to the surface. Okay, so that's a very important mechanism for insulin. Now, if we go back to the other effects of insulin, um, now, now these effects here are not what most people think about under normal conditions, okay? And these are really under pathophysiological conditions. And the first one here is that when insulin binds to its receptor on skeletal muscle in particular, maybe other cells too, it turns on the sodium potassium ATPase pumps. Now that's important because remember, sodium potassium ATPases, they pump sodium out of the cell. In fact, it's three sodiums. And it takes uh, two potassium into the cell. And so if you turn on this pump, you're really promoting potassium uptake. Now the reason why this is important is that when patients present with acute hyperkalemia, in other words, a very sudden onset, dangerously high potassium in the plasma, there's a lot of different things that you need to do to treat the patient, but one of them is you want to get that potassium level down. And um, an important mechanism to do that is to redistribute potassium to the inside of the cell. And when, when you administer insulin to these patients, it helps get that potassium back into cells and lowers plasma potassium. Now, since we know what insulin does to plasma glucose, it would make sense that if you're going to do this, you want to give glucose along with the insulin. And in fact, that's what, that's what occurs when you use insulin this way to treat acute hyperkalemia. Okay, so even though this is not something we typically think about, insulin having an important role in normal physiology, this has a very important uh, implications for um, this, this specific case of acute hyperkalemia. Now, the other important thing that we can talk about with insulin with regard to pathophysio pathophysiology is that when you have very high levels of insulin, and this is when you, you, you commonly see this when somebody has insulin resistance and there's a compensatory uh, increase insulin output from beta cells, at least initially uh, in, in um, type 2 diabetics or, or just um, even pre-diabetics who have, have a lot of insulin resistance, this high insulin can cross over and bind other receptors. And this isn't uh, surprising. We, 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 we see this in pharmacology. Whenever you have a higher level of a drug or a hormone, you start to get off-target effects. Um, so insulin normally doesn't have a lot of effects on IGF-1 insulin-like growth factor 1 receptors, but when there's high levels of insulin, we can see this effect. Now, if you recall from endocrinology that IGF-1 is a very important hormone that mediates uh, all the growth effects, most of the growth effects of growth hormone, okay? And IGF-1 receptors are a lot of different places. And um, what you see then when you have insulin crossing over, some very important clinical effects. One of them is something called acanthosis nigricans which is um, a darkening and thickening of the skin in, in specific regions, um, you know, the back of the neck, the axilla, some other areas that are, are very important to identify patients, uh, this from physical exam, who might have high levels of in insulin, um, usually this is from insulin resistance. So acanthosis nigricans is very important, and, and the high levels of insulin are probably binding the IGF-1 receptors on the skin. Now, another place where IGF-1 receptors are important that insulin can bind to are on the theca cells in the ovary, okay? And um, you might remember that the theca cells, they uh, produce testosterone or other androgens, like androstenedione, and when there's hyperinsulinemia, the female ovary overproduces androgens and could cause hyperandrogenemia, okay, or hyperandrogenism. And that's important because that can cause acne, that can cause hirsutism, it can cause problems with ovulation that are all part of that syndrome that's very common cause of infertility or subfertility in women called polycystic ovarian syndrome. And hyperinsulinemia plays a very important role in that disorder in a lot of women. Okay, so, so um, um, it, it, we could take advantage of this because women who have PCOS one important therapy that's often tried is they are given drugs that lower insulin, like metformin, and that helps them um, decrease the androgen production from the ovary. Okay, so this has very important clinical implications. And very rarely, if there's a really high insulin level, 
there's so much stimulation of IGF-1 receptors, they can almost look, have a kind of a pseudo-acromegaly or, or a kind of look like um, they have IGF-1 excess, you know, in patients who have growth hormone excess. That's not really um, that easy to do, but you really need profoundly high levels of insulin to do that. But certainly the effects of insulin on potassium uptake and the effects on reproductive function of the ovary have very important clinical applications that you have to think about. So that concludes the, um, the dis discussion here of insulin-mediated effects uh, through its transduction pathway, the insulin receptor, as well as off-target effects, um, you know, and sort of pathophysiological significance, potassium uptake, and uh, binding to IGF-1 receptors. And that concludes this lecture on insulin-mediated effects.